Examiner.com is here at the Houston Ballet Center for Dance in downtown Houston, Texas to speak with the beautiful and amazingly talented ballet dancer Jessica Collado. Jessica, we have so much to talk about because you have been so very busy lately. First of all, you were recently promoted to first soloist, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, where were you when you formally found out about the promotion? I was here in this building. Um, it happened kind of at the end of last season, but it was supposed to be kind of hush-hush until the beginning of the season. And yeah, after class, our company manager came up to me and said, uh, Stan wants to see him for a meeting at lunch. And I was like, okay. And all of the staff was in there, and that's what happened. In addition, um, as we are shooting this, it, it, this is only four days after your birthday. So happy birthday. Thank you. And um, ironically, that was also uh, opening night of the Houston Ballet 2013-14 uh, season which you, in essence, opened in your beautiful red gown and graceful and dramatic performance in the American premiere of choreographer Christopher Bruce's Intimate Pages in the evening of the four premieres. And you were fantastic in that, and it was delightful seeing you in your first night as first soloist dancing so wonderfully. Yeah, it was a wonderful day slash evening. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my birthday. Um, this piece that we did by Christopher Bruce, it's, I am in love with it. I think it's phenomenal. And it's, it was such a fulfilling experience, especially to perform on stage every night um, and on my birthday. So it was a treat for me. Speaking of being busy, now, before that happened, in your spring break, you had been performing in Italy. Yes. Now, tell me about that. Uh, so there's a couple companies that I ki kind of try and do guestings with when I can, um, which kind of only allows me to do them when we have a break here at the ballet. Um, in the spring I was dancing with, um, it's a Houston-based company called IME, which stands for Infinite Movement Ever Evolving. Um, and it's a little contemporary company, um, kind of pick up artists. I went with Oliver and Melissa Hogue, who also dance or bless me, I'm more of a dance here with Houston. Um, and we got to do shows in Turin, Italy, which was really, really exciting. Um, great audiences, they loved us, and yeah, it was a great experience. So then after that, during your summer break, which yes. you're supposed to be relaxing on the beach and having yes. fun, you were instead in San Francisco performing. And yes. what were you doing there? Um, I was dancing for another friend. Um, this company is called Post Ballet. Um, the director is named is Robert Deckers, and he was kind of the the only guy at my little studio growing up. And we danced together until we both left to kind of go dance professionally. But I've known him since we were babies, and he now lives in San Francisco and has started this company. Um, this summer was its its fourth year, and yeah, I try and go and dance with him when I can. I'm really proud of what he's done. And then between um, the next ballet and the fall run of the Nutcracker, the company is already in rehearsal for ballets that you are taking to New York, and then it's apparently Paris. Correct. Tell me about those engagements. They are very exciting. Um, we're going back to the Joyce this year for a week, which is great because we get to do like seven shows um, in New York where we're taking four different ballets. Um, kind of a mix of all different styles. And then right from New York, we leave to go to Paris for a week. Um, we're dancing alongside Lang Lang, who is this really famous up and coming pianist. <laughs> so I think it's going to be really awesome.
that's that's really tough duty. Yeah. Hard but life. it's a job. You have to do what you're told to do, I guess. Take orders and go to Paris. Okay, now, my original purpose for this interview was to speak to an experienced ballet dancer to see what life is like for those of us who have no idea what goes on behind the curtain, so to speak, in the life of a, a ballet dancer. So if you wouldn't mind answering a few civilian questions of, course. Of, um, of what it's like to be a ballet dancer. Okay, now, during the season when you were in rehearsal, what is your normal daily work routine? Um, we go through chunks of time where we, we call it rehearsal schedule, where we start at 10 in the morning. Um, we have class for an hour and a half. Sometimes we're all combined, sometimes we split men and women, sometimes it's by rank, it kind of switches up. And um, then after that, we rehearse for six hours. Um, usually it's, we're alternating between three, four, sometimes five different ballets. Um, other days it'll be a full call, all of maybe a full length that we're working on. And um, we usually go th for about five weeks of this rehearsal period, and then we kind of switch to our theater schedule, which... Is, is that routine the same every single day of, of, the, of the week, or is it different on different days? Um, depending on the schedule, um, I always kind of plan on being here six hours a day. That's usually how it works. Um, but sometimes we'll get a random hour off, and we can go run an errand. Or... So then how is that routine different on performance days? Well, when we go into the theater, we start later. Um, our class is uh, usually around 12.30, and we'll rehearse until like 4.30 in the afternoon and then have like a three, two-hour break. Um, and then at night, we'll either have our dress rehearsal or our performance, which starts at 7.30, and then finish around 10.30 at night. So kind of our, our whole day is pushed back. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, now, different question. As a dancer, do you work out in a physical training sense, or are your continual rehearsals enough to keep you physically in shape? That is a good question. Um, depending on how heavy my load is, but as I've gotten older, I realize that kind of body conditioning is becoming a lot more important, just to keep healthy and um, yeah, not to get injured and stuff. So I do spend a lot of time, I say, down in our, our BC, our body conditioning studio, whether it's um, working on my stamina or if it's doing exercises to strengthen my hips or my shoulders or, or I'm down there quite a bit. <laughs> now, following on that, being that your body is your instrument and a performance machine, if I can call it that, do you have a regular diet of specific foods or is it fairly flexible? Um... I enjoy to eat healthy. Um, a lot of people, I think a lot of dancers do. You just kind of feel better when you're eating good foods. Um, and I, when our rehearsal schedule is really tough, I try and eat a lot of protein um, and carbs because that's also really good for energy. Um, and maybe some sweets if you need like a little energy booster. <laughs> well, the follow-up question to that is, do you have any secret indulgence that you treat yourself to occasionally. Occasionally. Hmm. I have a big sweet tooth, so it's maybe more than occasionally, but I try and limit. Um, I don't know. Well, what would, love... g give me a favorite sweet that really would favorite be... Favorite sweet? Maybe pistachio gelato. Is Ooh. Up there. Okay. Now, Another vein, uh, because of the alternating of different dancers on different nights, there are many different cast combinations, and so in some cases many different parts that you have to learn for each ballet. Plus, you are also rehearsing for the next ballet in the pair and various future special projects. How do you get your specific assignments for all the different ballets and cast part versions? Well, we do find out our schedule maybe two days in advance, um, so you can kind of prepare yourself as to what you will be rehearsing the next day. If it's something totally new that you haven't been working on for a while, you can kind of switch gears and have a think about that before you get in the studio and are totally clueless. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's just the way we're trained. We're trained to kind of juggle all these roles and the more we rehearse them, the more they kind of become muscle memory and just hearing the music brings the steps back. So you're not really getting them a long time ahead of time. It's kind of a on each 
day or a couple of days ahead of time. It's an organic process, True. flowing based on, I guess, what's going on and what needs yeah. to be concentrated on. Exactly. At, at the whim of the choreographer or the artistic director. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how does it work in recording choreography for classic choreographies that are meant to be repeated accurately and are passed on to successive companies? Are there notes or are there a special set of symbols or terminology? How does that work? There, there is. There's actually a whole technique um, of notating ballet steps. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's, you look at it and it looks like a different language. It's dots and squiggles and, and I don't know how to read it. Um, one of our ballet masters is trained in, in notating. But it's funny how it's kind of becoming a lost art, so to speak, and now everything is, is becoming digital. And when we bring a ballet back, we'll just watch the DVD. Uh, because the, the DVD recordings are, are so accurate and clear, um, as opposed to old school VHSs, which were a big blur and you couldn't tell what was happening. When you are rehearsing uh, the actual ballet performances, how much choreography is specifically mandated by the previous legacy choreography, and how much is interpretation by the current choreographer, or as you as the artist? I think it's depend it depends on the role in, in the ballet. Um, when it comes to really classical stuff, I think it's very, it tends to stay very accurate, very true to what it was originally. Um, in, say, this ballet into pages that I just performed, we also watched that from a video. Um, but the last time it was performed, it was in 1984, so Christopher Bruce did allow some room for interpretation or to kind of modernize it a little bit, and he ended up changing the whole ending, so, yeah. Okay, well, if it's a newly created, like a world premiere, like we saw a couple of those on opening night, uh, newly performed work for the Houston Ballet that's never been performed before, how does that work? How is that different from working from a legacy choreography roadmap? It's, it can be a tedious process. Um, every choreographer is different. The way they work, the way they kind of put a ballet together, um, whether it's just simply steps that come first and then we put to music after, or if it's the music that drives the movement. Um, it's always a different process, and it usually involves a lot of repetition. And I think that is what's helpful, helpful for the choreographer to see, is to see it happening over and over and, and see where it wants to move to next. Uh, Houston Ballet um, actually performs a, a pretty equal balance between classical and contemporary ballet and does uh, both exceedingly well, as do you. What, what is the difference for the dancer between the classic dancing on toe versus the contemporary dancing on flag? A lot of things. A little birdie, a little birdie, come sing to me your song. I got a short time for to stay here, a long time to be gone, you know. I would rather be a sailor, sailing on the deep blue sea, than to be a married woman with a baby on my knee. A little birdie, a little birdie, come sing to me your song. I got a short time for to stay here, a long time to be gone. It, it's a totally different technique, and it's difficult when you have to do the two in one evening because you kind of have to get your body in that mode. Um, I love the contemporary stuff. It's always more earthy, more grounded, more heavier in your legs. Um, and the, the pieces that are usually on point involve, involve a lot of footwork where you need to be, you need to have a sense of your center um, and your ankles need to be really warm. And yeah, juggling the two can be tricky. Um, Is any one more difficult than the other? Not, in, they're just different in different ways. Um, the classical stuff tends to be very black and white, kind of. Um, because the steps are very clear of what it should be done or what it's supposed to be. Um, sometimes it works or it doesn't. Contemporary has a little more, I guess, room for interpretation on stage. Okay, now getting back to this sort of the subject of, of the repetition and the rehearsal, 
for those of us who sit in the audience and watch the many varieties of ballets, I think most people think, how can they possibly remember all of those steps and moves and positions? Good grief. Now, obviously you are a professional and that is what you do, but while you are performing, are you trying to remember all the steps? Or have you internalized all that during the repetitive rehearsal process? I guess in short, what I'm asking is, what are you thinking about when you're dancing? And that's a really hard question, um, especially when we're performing. Ideally, the best is, is when you've done the piece enough where you don't have to think about the steps, and you can be on stage, and you can perform, and kind of be in it, so to speak. I guess be telling the story as if it was happening for the first time, so it's real and it's live. And um, But there are some times when the steps are just like playing and playing and playing in your head, and you are kind of having to think about what's going to happen next. Um, it's always a little more of a, an anxious feeling when that's happening. Not totally relaxed, I guess. But are there times where you don't think of a single step, your body has it covered, and you're just, oh, yeah. and you, you're, you're feeling like you're the character in that scene, and it's really happening. Exactly. Dancing looks like it must be really fun. What does it feel like to dance and to go through all the physical movements of all the styles and moves and positions? It's, I, I love it. it um, it's a way of expressing emotion and feeling in a way that you can't vocally, and to me, that's really gratifying um, to kind of get lost in the movement and let it speak is, I don't know, it's a very fulfilling experience. Okay. Now, different question. You have all these fellow dancers in the company that you work with very closely for years and spend a lot of hours of time with. Can you give me the sense of community that you develop with your fellow dancers? Oh, for sure. Um, and this company, too, I feel more so than most, that we are very much a family. We're very united. And we are very um, supportive of each other. Um, I think the work ethic in this company is extraordinary. And in that, I think we kind of rally together and, and push each other and work together. Um, yeah, these are like my closest friends. I call them like my family. Yeah, I, it, I just attended the, this open rehearsal that it, where it's sort of like not officially a performance and it's clear how much fun you have with each other and, and how much camaraderie there is. And that was enjoyable to watch. And so it, it, it must be enjoyable to, to actually have these people that you've spent a lot of time with that you get to know so well. Now, getting back to your story, uh, when in your life did you know you wanted to pursue ballet? And what was it about ballet that hooked you? I don't know. I got really serious in ballet. Um, I would say maybe when I was in high school. Um, I played a lot of other sports growing up, and those kind of slowly trickled out as dance became more prominent. And I, I was a senior in high school, and I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, my parents really wanted me to go to college, and I kind of did both. I owned companies, I applied for colleges with really good dance programs, still not really sure what I wanted to do, and um, and that's when I decided to come to Houston, and I was in school here for a year, and I think that was definitely my sign that this is something that I, I think I can be really good at and I want to pursue. And so, how did you, uh, really, how did you come to be at Houston Ballet, and uh, what has it been like being with Houston Ballet, living in Houston? Houston grows on you. I, I really like it. Um, it's such a thriving city, especially right now, that it's, it's nice to be a part of as it's growing. Um, I first came to Houston, it was like for a summer program when I was maybe 15, um, and then continued to come back because I, I love the program here. It was hard, but I loved it. I was pushed. Um, so that's kind of what drew me in, I guess, from the start. So in comparing bios, it appears that you arrived at Houston Ballet about the same time as artistic director Stanton Welch did, who is currently celebrating 10 years with Houston Ballet. What has it been like working with him for the past 10 years? 
Great. His first year as director was my year in the Academy. And um, for our spring show, we were doing a piece of his, and none of us really knew much about Stan, how he was, how his choreography was. Um, and he came into our rehearsals, and we were all, like, terrified. But he saw something special in me, and he gave me a really a beautiful part to dance on my graduation show. And I think since then, he's kind of taken me under his wing and, yeah, pushed me to, to where I am now. Now, in another aspect of your time here in Houston, you've had the privilege of working in the old Houston Ballet headquarters building for several years. And then you were able to see this amazing new Houston LA Center for Dance being built in downtown Houston, and then move into it. What has that transition been like, and what is it? What, what I guess what is daily life like here in comparison to the old facility? It's different. The old building was it was much smaller. Um, you were always on top of the academy kids, like we're all just jumbled together all the time because it was it was packed with people. Like we needed more space, um, and moving in here, it's such a it's a beautiful building, and there's so much space that it's definitely a different vibe. Um, and I think it has gotten warmer as, since we've been here, or since we've initially moved. Um, but we're able to do so much more. So many more, more rehearsals can happen at once, and um, I think the academy has the opportunity to expand like double fold now because they have their own space. Okay, now, my last question for you is, in the Wortham Theater Center, which is now across the street, the main Brown Theater, which Houston Ballet performs in, has a published capacity of 2,465 seats. When a wonderful Houston Ballet performance ends, and the sold-out house is standing and applauding a magnificent performance, as it quite often does, after all the hard work that you have put into it, what does it feel like to stand there and hear that thundering ovation and see all those wildly applauding audience members? It's, there are no words to describe it. It's crazy. There have been times when the curtain goes down and you can hear the audience clapping and I just start to cry. Um, no, I think that's probably the most rewarding part. Is, yeah, giving yourself on stage, like you let it all out, it's all in the audience's hands, and to see that they have gone there with you and they've, they've loved every moment of it, that's, yeah, that makes it all worth it. <laughs> well, we have been speaking with ballet dancer Jessica Collado. Jessica, once again, congratulations on your promotion to first soloist. Happy birthday. <laughs> and thank you so much for speaking to examiner.com. Sure. That's it. <laughs>